Hello everybody and welcome to another video. So this is the first in what I hope is a long series on tabletop history. And I, for those of you who follow my channel, uh, you know that I love everything about tabletop history. RPGs, war games, CCGs, kind of the whole thing. And I'm fascinated by all the companies and people that have made this big industry so great. And I thought it'd be really fun to do a video series that kind of explores the different personalities and games and companies and kind of everything that has made up this this genre for but it's still a pretty young genre about 40 years or so and since this is the first video in the series i thought why not start with games workshop um of course the makers of warhammer as everybody knows but i want to focus on a very specific part of games workshop Namely, I want to focus on the early years. So this is 1975 to 1983. This is a fun, mysterious indie period in their history. And I, I think that a lot of people who play their games now or have in the past aren't even really aware of how amazing this period is. And so I thought, hey, let's, uh, let's start there. Seems appropriate. Where shall we begin the beginning? So let's get into it. The beginning, of course. So let's go back to 1975. You've got three, basically, schoolmates, Ian Livingston, uh, Steve Jackson. I put the other one because if you are if you know Steve Jackson games, makers of things like GURPS and that sort of thing, it's, it's not that Steve Jackson. It's the other Steve Jackson. Um, both, ironically, have been in, in immensely contributory to the success of, of games and tabletop games over the decades. And John Peake. So these three guys get together and found Games Workshop. Um, I found the working names to be pretty fun. Other names that they floated about were Games Garage and Galactic Games. So just think, you could be playing Games Garage's new newest game, Warhammer. Uh, I have a feeling that if that had been what they'd settled on, there would have been a rebranding at some point in time. So there you go. So how did they start? Well, they started with small, like, handcrafted games. So this is like Go, uh, Nine Men's Morris, Backgammon, etc. These were like, John Peake would hand make these, and they were extremely high quality, like well-finished mahogany and such. There, there was a very high quality niche product of these extremely classic games. Uh, Ian would sell them to local stores, and Steve basically filled the role of office manager, who, also being a handy artist, drew artwork for Games and Puzzles magazine. Um, they, which was a small contract they had that, it, as a point of fact, was really their main source of revenue in the early days of the company. Um, because the reality is they couldn't sell enough little tiny wooden boxes to, to really make a substantial, you know, revenue for the three of them to actually keep the company going. And this sort of involvement in early magazines and newsletters and publishing kind of got a little bit of a taste they got the taste for it, right? And as they were talking, they, they basically came to the idea that they needed to market their business to help the, the uh, you know, the physical product grow in its marketability. Going to each local store and, and trying to sell it directly to that store and then having customers come in and buy it was a lengthy and, frankly, not great process. The distribution model for games certainly wasn't up to snuff yet in the 70s. This, that would really come a lot later. And so they thought, well, let's make a magazine. I mean, really, it was a newsletter more than anything. Um, it's often referred to as a magazine, but it, it, it's as a point of fact, we're going to look at it here in a minute, and you're going to see what it looks like, and it's a newsletter. Um, and zine publishing, newsletter publishing magazines was crazy big in the 70s. If you go back to the early history of all these games across war games and RPGs and all these companies you're going to see that these people were connecting and talking and learning about the industry from these zines because it was really the only form of sort of mass communication where you could learn about these things. Um, it was the only way you got knowledge of what was available beyond what your friends knew about. Uh, there were no friendly local game stores, really, in the way that we think of them now. And there wasn't obviously any internet, duh, it's the 70s. So what do you do? Well, you read magazines, zines, newsletters, etc. Um, and, and all across 
the industry. These were hugely impactful. So that magazine or newsletter, whatever you want to call it, was called Owl and Weasel. And it was written mostly by Steve Jackson, though the other people certainly contributed. Um, and the way that they ended up marketing it, most interestingly, was they got the distribution list for a defunct zine called Albion, which was run by a man named Don Turnbull. Uh, he's going to be very important in other parts of this story. Um, not that we're going to talk about, he's not going to come up anymore today, though somewhat unfairly, but I've only got a short amount of time. Um, Don ends up being a very, very important figure as Games Workshop continues to evolve, but we'll probably talk about him later. Um, and as a funny point of fact that sometimes blind marketing works, you know, you think about how much stuff you get in the mail today, you probably just throw away. Here's a funny example. So, basically, one of the recipients of Albion, out of this list that they had gotten, was a man named Brian Bloom, who just happened to be one of the founders of TSR. And if you know anything about TSR or the early days of RPGs, you know that they had published a little game called Dungeons & Dragons the previous year in 1974. Now, we think of D&D right now as sort of this unbelievable titan within the RPG industry. It is and always has been the sort of biggest, as it were. Um, but in 1975, it was still very much struggling to find an audience. It was a very different game. It certainly had a popularity to it, but it was very indie and sort of underground. People learn about it through these zines and stuff like that. Owl and Weasel, in their first issue, had this call for progressive games, which isn't anything political. It simply meant that they were looking to expand out of the realm of these classic little sort of physical games that had been made, these classic games that had been around forever. They were looking for the new hot, right? That's what they wanted. And I'm paraphrasing, of course. But uh, Brian basically responded to them with a letter saying he loved Owl and Weasel uh, and sent him a copy of D&D. And there's a great quote from Livingston and Steve Jackson where, to, I'll paraphrase it, that basically is something along the lines of, they got the box, they opened it, they read the rules, they played it, and that was it. They were hooked. Like, right there. Um, which I don't think was an uncommon reaction to the game. It's hard for us to really, you know, standing now where we are, to really understand how different D&D was than more or less anything most people had experienced at that time. This weird combination of role-playing, which had certainly been around in, in various more like LARPy ways, like LARP actually predates RPGs, tabletops, by a significant amount. Um, but that weird combination of role-playing and sort of the idea of having a dungeon and exploration and monsters in this fantasy setting, it was all very new and different and exciting. And there was a big group of people out there who probably grew up, you know, reading lots of, of fantasy and science fiction fantasy authors, um, the same ones that would appear in Appendix N that had no game to play. So there we go. But this isn't a story about D&D yet. This is a story about Games Workshop. So why does it matter that they got this copy of D&D and that they loved it? By the way, that's what issue one of Owl and Weasel looks like. So there you go. Uh, definitely, uh, you can see how that would definitely um, move a lot of product. Okay. It matters because it was the British invasion, but in reverse. <laughs> it was the invasion of Britain. So in 1976, Peake, who really didn't have an appetite for progressive games and was more of a craftsman, left the company. Livingston and Jackson steered Games Workshop into a three-year exclusive deal to sell D&D in Europe. I cannot explain to you how big of a deal this was. Because they weren't just selling the thing. As the next point says, remember, they've got this newsletter. It's got a pretty good distribution list. And so Alan Weasel number six is completely dedicated to D&D. And the magazine largely focuses on D&D throughout and then from issue like 13 until it eventually morphs into its final form sometime later, which we'll come to in a few moments. 
Uh, it really heavily pushed D&D. So people are reading this magazine about a lot of different fantasy content or games or just thoughts about gaming, and then all of a sudden they're seeing all this stuff about D&D. And when D&D hit Britain, it was or the UK or whatever you want to say, um, it was massive. Like immediately people seized on it, much as they did here in the States and, and other places around the world. Um, the original number of copies of D&D <laughs> that Livingston and Jackson got to sell, like at the beginning of that exclusive deal, how many copies did they get to sell off? The answer is six. Six is what they could afford to pick up right away out of the gate. Those sold immediately. They ordered a lot more. Those sold immediately. Okay. And so then we come to this funny period in between 76 and 77 where Livingston and Jackson were working out of their flat, but because people would stop by their house, remember their address is like printed on these, on these magazines, on this zine, right? I showed you the previous page. There was a, there was an address on there. That was their address. So people would stop by expecting to find a storefront of some kind and in fact just find some people's apartments. Their landlord didn't cotton to that very well and so kicked them out. They left with they lived with uh, Livingston's girlfriend for a little while and then were sleeping in a van outside of their office, which was itself just an, the, the back room of an estate agent shop in Shepherd's Bush. And they had to join a squash club just to actually grab a shower each day because they, they had no such facilities. And all while this is happening, orders are rushing in for D&D as well as a lot of other products like the company was exploding um, by the standards of the time, they were making a very good amount, amount of money, <clears throat> and yet <laughs> they're living out of a car uh, using a back office of a real estate agent as their, as, as their actual, you know, sort of place of business. So I, that's a particularly fun story. Obviously, they didn't stay there long. We'll come to what eventually happens to them uh, here very soon. So an important thing to note is to pick up on a thread that I, I had talked about earlier, that there really wasn't friendly local game stores in the way we think of them today, right? You've got a lot of bookstores that might carry, like, board games, or, or there are stores that sell games, right? But they're mostly, like, board games or those traditional games, much like what Peak was originally making. That's because there just wasn't this other genre. It didn't exist. There were some historicals, of course. Those had been around for quite a while, but in the world of, like, big miniature games, RPGs, and certainly card games didn't even exist yet in the way we think of them now. CCGs, collectible card games. Um, they just weren't really there. So a lot of these stores didn't want to carry these weird, silly, crazy RPGs with their weird art on the cover of, you know, scantily clad women and big, uh, bare-chested barbarians. And so, uh, basically... Livingston and Jackson decided, well, they would stick to their core competency. So they relaunched Owl and Weasel as a true magazine, a professional publication solely focused on expanding the market reach of their, basically what at this time was their import business. Um, they were importing not just D&D, but very soon we're going to see they get deals with a lot of other companies, as well as other games as well, not just RPGs, but other board games and things like that into the UK and into Europe and selling them. And so they so they launched in 1977 White Dwarf, which of course we're still familiar with to this day. Now, the reason it's called White Dwarf is because in the 70s, fantasy and science fiction were largely the same concept. We and this is one of those things that's always been funny to me. The we think of fantasy and science fiction as being two completely separate things. Like one looks like Lord of the Rings and one looks like I don't know, uh, Buck Rogers in the 25th and a half century or something, right? Um, but for a lengthy period of time, that line wasn't there. And if you think back to the cartoons, if you're my age, uh, if you think back to the cartoons you watched as a, as a young man, you probably recognize that those lines were soft. When you think of, like, uh, Thundar the Barbarian or He-Man or the Thundercats, Think of the fact that people in those cartoons were using swords and nunchucks, but also driving tanks and shooting laser guns. Okay? These two concepts were very closely tied together. 
So hence, white dwarf, because it's both an astronomical term, it's a white dwarf star, and it's a fantasy creature. So, hence, the white dwarf is born. Of course, later on, you would get the, the adorable little white dwarf himself, who would be, you know, the mascot for the magazine for many, many, many years to come. And there you go. That is the glorious original color copy of White Dwarf number one, June, July, 1977. You'll notice in its original run, it was actually a bi-monthly magazine. came out once every two months. Uh, it is 60p or $2. So there you go. All right. This is actually the second reprint, apparently. But there you go. Big bada boom. So, uh, why are we quoting Lilu from The Fifth Element? Because there's a game changer here. And I wanted to start off with this quote. This is Steve Jackson said this in an interview uh, on IGN in 1998. And I think this is really important. I'm just going to read it directly, not that you can't read what's on the screen. But it's really important. Outside of the U.S., we published the first FRP mag, White Dwarf, organized the first convention. They actually organized many, to be fair. He's actually understating the number of conventions they did. Started the first major miniatures company, opened the first FRP shop, and so on. And no one, not even TSR, had such an integrated games company. That is so essential to the story of Early Games Workshop. There was nothing they wouldn't do. Okay? They were trying and expanding out into everything. There, and, and you're going to see that as we cover on the next couple subjects. The first thing they did was do something that nobody else who was making games did. They opened a store. Uh, if you remember, they were officing out of the back of a real estate agent. And when the real estate agent complained, they said, great, find us a cheap shop we can work out of. So he did. And on April 1st, ironically, I suppose, April Fool's Day, uh, 1978, the first Games Workshop store opens in Hammersmith. You've probably seen this picture. It's a very famous picture. This is absolutely real. When the store opened that morning, there were more than 100 people waiting to buy stuff. What were they waiting to buy? Mainly D&D. &D. <laughs> Not only. By 78, there are other games and board games and other things in the mix. But I'm betting a lot of people in that line are, are excited to get some, some new hot D&D &D products. Um... What's fascinating is around this time, Games Workshop actually gets a license to publish original D&D &D content that is branded with the Dungeons & Dragons logo. And what you have to understand is in the TSR period, this did not happen, okay? It just, they, they, nobody got those rights. But Games Workshop did. So they could publish official D&D &D stuff. Huge deal. Um, because that meant they were making stuff that the people in the States didn't have. They had original products as well as imports, okay? And that then leads to the next thing they do. So they get a license to manufacture Ral Partha miniatures. Now, those of you who know a lot about the history of miniatures know a lot about Ral Partha, who was a huge name in miniatures in this time, in the, like this 70s, 80s, even into the 90s period. And <clears throat> Ral Partha miniatures were mainly used in, in all sorts of games, some small standalone games, often used for figures in D&D in &D and other things like that, often just collected for people who liked to collect and paint miniatures, which certainly was a thing long before anybody started playing games with them. And so uh, Livingston and Jackson partner with Brian Ansel to found a company called Citadel Miniatures, which is going to be a sister company to Games Workshop. Okay. Now, obviously, Citadel is going to be very important as this story continues to evolve. Because the story of between 1978 and 1983 is a story of innovation. When I said that Games Workshop's unafraid to try anything in this period, I really mean it. Um, over the next three years, they sort of expand this empire of games that they have the sole rights to distribute. So they get Traveler, they get Gangster, they get RuneQuest. I think they ended up, I don't list here, but I think they ended up getting Call of Cthulhu as well. And uh, all of these games are then supported by articles in White Dwarf. So they can get the games and sell them. And then they have a magazine that can run articles about it and supply additional content for it and popularize it. It proves to be a really successful combination. Okay. Okay. 
they also, as I said, started printing... Not only do they print original D&D products, but they start printing their actual UK versions of D&D products. Okay? So what happens here is, up till this point, they had been taking versions of the Player's Handbook or Monster Manual or whatever it happened to be at that time, importing it over to the UK and then reselling it, which meant that they had to sell it for about seven pounds a piece. Uh, so that's probably around 50 bucks adjusted for inflation in today's money. But when they, uh, when they started printing them themselves, and more or less they were just straight reprints, especially in the beginning. Now, later on they would make changes, but in the beginning it was more or less just a straight reprint, except it was printed in the UK, suddenly without all those costs of shipping, which is still hugely expensive at this time. Each copy gets significantly cheaper. It sells for about uh, £4.50, which... That's a big chunk of change in difference. Uh, that would be about $35 in today's money. So you can, I mean, you can think of the difference between wanting to spend 50 bucks and 35 It's a big difference. Um, they also, during this time, continue to aggressively expand their retail stores. They open several new locations. And maybe most interestingly for how things continue to evolve in the company... They also launched the Fighting Fantasy series of books, which I've got the first one of here on the side. They released it through Puffin, Puffin Books, uh, and it was the Warlock of Firetop Mountain. So these were a sort of mix of choose-your-own-adventure and a lot of solo adventures that were published by several, uh, several RPG makers in the U.S., uh, namely like... Uh, I think Flying Buffalo did some, but there were there were others. Certainly, many people were publishing solo style adventures, uh, and that were sort of made to be run your, by yourself for yourself. Uh, the ultimate I don't have any friends, but I want to role play game. <laughs> so they put out these these fighting fantasy series of books, and once again, they popularize them in White Dwarf, and the orders start rolling in, and Puffin just is banging on their door to get more. Over the next few years, they would produce a ton of these fighting fantasy books, and the line would actually continue into the 90s, though that's going to extend well beyond what we're going to cover today. Um, I'll probably do a future video at some point far in the future specifically on fighting fantasy and these sort of choose-your-own-adventure books, which were an interesting little microcosm of, of product into themselves that sort of came, exploded, and then kind of went away or morphed into a new form. So that brings us to a new era. And of course, there's only one thing that could happen in the new era. So, as I said, Games Workshop is sort of just relentlessly exploring new ideas. And a giant example of this happened in 1983 when Brian Ansel, who you'll remember from Citadel Miniatures, uh, Rick Priestley and Richard, I don't know how to say his name, Hollowell, I'm going to guess, if I'm wrong, I apologize, Richard. Uh, create a new game titled Warhammer Fantasy Battle. And what I've got here is sort of an image from the copy of the, from the first edition of the game. And this was actually launched by, by Citadel, uh, Games Workshop, sister company. And what would happen here is that the, the sort of combination of the knowledge of miniatures, RPGs, marketing through White Dwarf, and their unique position, because by this point, they have wrangled so many sole rights to distribute games in Europe. They are just, they've become the name in, uh, in gaming in Europe. It's not that other people weren't around and other people weren't successful. Certainly they were. I don't mean, I'm not trying to undervalue other companies that were around. There were other companies. But they were a titan. And, and here's a simple proof in the pudding of that. Um, TSR came into the UK at this time period and tried to launch their own magazine called Imagine that was sort of meant to be, you know, they had been successful with Dragon Magazine, so they came to the UK and they were going to make a new magazine. It folded within two years. White Dwarf was just unassailable, more or less, at this point. So Warhammer is born. In 1983, when we get, as it says right there, the mass combat fantasy role-playing game. Very key. I really want to key everybody in to that word. 
Because remember, at this time period, Games Workshop is defined by the fact, to a point, that as being the company that sells D&D in Europe. And so they have this sort of very deep understanding of it. And frankly, D&D was just a titan at this time period. Uh, as a, a sort of what else is happening at this time, 1983 would be the most successful year for Dungeons & Dragons by sales, adjusted for inflation, more or less until the modern day. There were two other years that are close, one of which we don't have exact numbers for because they were never made public, and that was the, the year of the launch of 5th edition, but it's pretty believed that that finally surpassed it. The other year was the launch of 3rd edition, 2001. Um, both of which adjusted for inflation are basically so close as to be... In, uh, that in 1983 are so close. So, it is a massive year for gaming. 1983, gaming explodes. And into this market, where everybody is buying whatever RPG game they can get their hands on, comes Warhammer, the mass combat fantasy role-playing game. Right? And that first edition actually looks a lot like Chainmail. And I'm not trying to impinge upon the design of these three people. It was a really, really clever, fun, interesting design. Uh, by when I say it looks like Chainmail, what I mean is that it sort of combines role-playing elements and story campaigns, but with miniatures and very, like, tactical sort of combat. Um, so it drew on both the newer ideas of the role-playing era, but also classic sort of war games stuff out of historicals and things like that. And it sort of synergized them all together into one game. Now, Warhammer 1st Edition is massive. It's hugely successful. Again, it's popularized in White Dwarf. You've got a company that's marketing it re relentlessly. And at the same time, they also want to continue pushing it. So, in years to come, it's going to change very, very rapidly. Now, most of us going back, if we read this today, most people who play Warhammer, I, I started personally in 4th edition. But if you go back and you look at this, it would not be a Warhammer like you know. But, here I wanted to share with you something that I think is pretty cool. So this is a sample character out of the first edition. And Wolfend, <laughs> which I like his name, probably saying it wrong, is a young Northman about to take part in an adventure. So here is the character stats. Now, what I love about this is there's lots of fun things going on here. Like, I love that cool is a stat, keeping his cool. Um, I, you know, like the numbers are obviously very different in what they mean. But here's what I love. Look at that second block of text. Attacks, wounds, initiative, weapon skill, bow skill, strength, toughness, move. Yep. So even in this first edition era, you can see the kernel of what would become the sort of template, right, for all of these games going forward. Even into the very modern period where we have um, a lot of these different things in play. So... Uh, I thought this was pretty cool. Obviously, it's a very, very different game, but I thought it was neat that the same sort of words and terms and definitions still apply. But with the launch of first edition Warhammer, the game is going to change for Games Workshop. But that also brings us to 1983 and the end of our story for the early period. So there you go. I hope you enjoy that little history. We will, uh, as always, I appreciate you watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and of course share. That's always the best thing you can do is share. Um, I always appreciate that. We're going to continue this series focusing on other companies and periods in time and products and all sorts of stuff. Uh, so I very much hope to see you next time. Have a good one.